in point of fact, it seems that in Chile today that you have better availability of cannabis as medicine than in many other countries, including parts of my own country, where we have this great divide between some states where there is access and many states where there is none at all. Um, but this is a growing movement, and I'm quite encouraged by what I see in Latin America, such that it's been a, a progression uh, in the topic of cannabis as medicine. And I think that you are really pioneers in this area that can teach us a great deal. I'm a neurologist. I left practice in 2003 uh, to enter uh, full-time research on medical applications of cannabis. But prior to that time, um, I had many patients who used cannabis for a wide variety of conditions. Perhaps a third of my patients with multiple sclerosis used it, many for chronic pain, uh, for treatment of migraine headaches, and a great number of other conditions. And I saw some amazing benefits, even at that time. El doctor Ethan Russo, de Estados Unidos, él es neurólogo, investigador en psicofarmacología, ex asesor médico de GW Farmacéuticas, laboratorio desarrollador de medicamentos en base a cannabis. Él participó en tres estudios clínicos fase 3 para la aprobación de Sativex, medicamento en base a cannabis para el tratamiento de la esclerosis múltiple. Ex presidente de la Asociación Internacional por el Cannabis como Medicamento y actual director médico de Fitex. El doctor Russo es además autor de diversos libros y artículos científicos relacionados con el cannabis medicinal. Lo recibimos, por favor, con un fuerte, fuerte aplauso. Buenos días y gracias. Um, estoy muy alegre de estar aquí con uh, ustedes hoy uh, en Chile. Uh, la tierra donde mi abuela vivaba uh, durante un tiempo corto hace más de 100 años. Desgraciadamente, voy a continuar en inglés. So, we're going to start off today talking about uh, the endocannabinoid system. This is a good part of the basis of how cannabis works. And there are three types of cannabinoids. The most familiar to you are the phytocannabinoids, the plant-based cannabinoids from cannabis, and with a few exceptions, few other plants. But additionally, some 20 years ago, it was discovered there, there are also endocannabinoids, cannabinoids within our bodies that work on some of the same receptors. The best known of these are anandamide, and two, ericodonal glycerol. And uh, these are part of the endocannabinoid system uh, whose functions are these. Relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect, as outlined uh, by Professor DiMarzo. Additionally, there have been synthetic cannabinoids, some of which were produced even before the discovery of cannabinoid receptors. But we'll be concentrating on the plant today which is always my favorite. This is a schematic of how the endocannabinoids work. They are not neurotransmitters, but rather they are neuromodulators. With um, neurotransmitters, the transmission is from the presynaptic neuron on top to the postsynaptic neuron. But with endocannabinoids, at least with 2-arachidonal glycerol, it works in reverse. On demand, there is production of this, and it goes from the postsynaptic neuron back to the presynaptic neuron and lodges on CB1, the psychoactive cannabinoid receptor, where its main function is to diminish the release of neurotransmitter. Now, let's use the example of glutamate. Glutamate is a stimulatory neurotransmitter. Um, it is very important in chronic pain states, neuropathic pain. If its release is excessive, then 
uh, stimulating CB1, either with cannabis or with anandamide or 2-AG, will reduce neuropathic pain. And this is what we find in practice. The CB1 receptor, the receptor that makes people high with cannabis, is widely distributed in the brain. In higher centers, it is in the basal ganglia. Um, it's also active in the reward pathways. Um, but um, interestingly, it is poorly represented in the areas in the medulla, the brain stem, that regulate breathing. So as we've heard, there is no amount of cannabis that will stop breathing, like occurs with opioid overdoses. But uh, cannabis is not active only in the brain. It's also active in the spinal cord and in the periphery, uh, and particularly in the gut. Uh, there's a whole separate nervous system called the enteric nervous system throughout uh, the digestive tract. I like to say that the gut and the brain speak the same language, and its functions are heavily influenced by the endocannabinoid system. But among the other areas uh, that are regulated by the endocannabinoid system, you see pain thresholds, uh, movements, emotions, whether someone will vomit or not, whether they will have a seizure or not. So basically, it regulates almost every aspect of physiological function. And yet, at least in the United States, the endocannabinoid system is not taught in medical schools. Um, and this is despite the fact that the CB1 receptor is the most abundant G protein coupled receptor in the brain, more than all the other neurotransmitters combined. Forget cannabis for a moment. Given this fact that I've just told you, why would we not want to know more about this vital function? There is a, an additional well-established receptor called CB2. This is not a psychoactive receptor. It's more an immunomodulatory and analgesic receptor, and it's mainly in the periphery, but will be expressed in the brain under conditions of insult, after a stroke, after head injury, things of this sort. Um, but if we have a drug or a natural agent like caryophylline that stimulates CB2 but not CB1, it has great potential to treat pain and inflammation and even fibrosis without producing psychoactive side effects. This is just a picture. You see many organs of the body and uh, the roles that CB2 will have there. We will not go into these in detail but you could consult this wonderful article um, to learn more about this. Additionally, you have both CB1 and CB2 in the skin, as we've heard alluded to previously. Um, and um, because the skin is accessible, at least the superficial layers, um, there is enough absorption to make this medically effective. And one of the areas uh, it could help would be acne. Now, nobody dies from acne, but many teenagers feel like they would die due to the condition, and it has a massive economic cost. Uh, so this is a very important uh, potential treatment. Um, actually, cannabidiol seems to be an ideal medicine because it has antibiotic properties and also reduces the release of sebum where the bacteria that cause acne uh, live. Uh, another picture of the endocannabinoid system in, in the body. Uh, it appears that this person is heartless, but in fact the endocannabinoid system works on the heart as well, and even the skeleton that does not show up well here. Uh, but it's recently been shown that cannabidiol actually will aid bone healing and may be used in the future in uh, emergency rooms to treat fractures. This is a picture of the biosynthetic pathway of cannabinoids in the plant. We won't go into it in too much detail, but I would like to point out uh, something very interesting. The precursors to the cannabinoids are called olivatolic acid and geranyl pyrophosphate. But 
Although those two go to the cannabinoids, geranol pyrophosphate is also a parent molecule to all of the terpenoids, the aromatic uh, chemicals in cannabis that also contribute greatly uh, to its effects. And depending on which enzymes are most active in the plant, you will get tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, cannabidiol, CBD, cannabichromine, or many others. There are over 100 cannabinoids that the plant produces. And we've only studied perhaps 12 of these in, to any degree. A little bit of detail about THC, the most familiar. Um, this was first positively identified in 1964 by Professor Mishulam uh, and synthesized at that time. Of course, it's a strong painkiller. Um, it additionally is a um, anti-inflammatory uh, by non-receptor mechanisms. It is neuroprotective. It is an antioxidant. Uh, it, on its own, is uh, 20 times more powerful than aspirin as an anti-inflammatory and twice that of hy hydrocortisone. One of its main benefits is as a muscle relaxant. The problem with most muscle relaxants that are used for spasticity, muscle tightness, is they simultaneously weaken the muscles. THC is distinct in that it produces muscle relaxation without loss of power unless the dose is extremely high. And this is the basis of its approval as a medicine as Sativex in now 27 countries. Also, it's a very powerful anti-emetic on Marinol, the synthetic THC, was approved in the United States in 1985 to treat uh, nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. So we had one slide on THC. We'll have four on cannabidiol because it actually is more versatile. Um, although in the early decades after the discovery of the cannabinoid structures, it did not get a lot of attention because it wasn't uh, intoxicating the way THC does, it likely will be more actively employed uh, than THC in the future, although both together are better. Um, this was actually first isolated in 1940, but the exact structure uh, became known in 1963. Uh, it has an interesting property in that it seems to antagonize some of the effects of THC. But it doesn't lodge on the CB1 receptor, rather a receptor to the side called an allosteric receptor, where it is a negative allosteric modulator. So it changes the effects of THC in the body. It also is a very prominent neuroprotective antioxidant, and it's stronger than vitamin C and vitamin E. A strange fact is, although uh, cannabidiol is a forbidden drug, in the United States, the U.S. government actually has a patent for this neuroprotective antioxidant effect. So this is an incompatible situation, but our government is used to such things. Additionally, it also is a TRIP-V1 receptor. It's like capsaicin uh, uh, that is in your chili peppers, but unlike it, it is not uh, caustic, uh, so it can affect the receptor and be useful for pain treatment on that level without uh, having this uh, strong effect. One of its most important uh, features is that it modulates uh, the endocannabinoid system. It seems to increase the release of anandamide and inhibit its breakdown, its hydrolysis. Uh, it is a very powerful anticonvulsant. We'll have a whole lecture on that. I won't talk about it much today, uh, although I certainly saw that in my practice as a neurologist. As opposed to THC, which can provoke anxiety when there's too much, cannabidiol is a prominent anti-anxiety agent. And it does this unlike most anxiety agents that produce sedation. CBD does not, as we will see. Um, you'll hear from Christina Sanchez, uh, a great deal more about the ability of the cannabinoids to treat cancer primarily. The salient fact 
about them is that they kill cancer cells selectively while being preservative of normal cells. So this is the opposite of standard chemotherapy agents where they're toxic to all the cells. And you hope that the tumor will be killed uh, before the patient is killed by the medicine or lose all their hair or the lining of their gut. Uh, it also works on something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is important in autoimmune diseases such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis and the inflammatory bowel uh, diseases. Uh, it does all these amazing things without being a COX-1 or COX-2 inhibitor, like the non-steroidals, which produce ulcers, heart attacks, and strokes as potential side effects. Um, about 12 years ago, the mechanism by which uh, cannabidiol was an anti-anxiety agent was not known. We knew it didn't work on CB1 directly, but I had a hypothesis that perhaps it worked on serotonin. And with my colleagues, we're able to show that it does have an agonistic effect on the serotonin 1A receptor. As it turned out, that's the basis not only of its effect on anxiety, but also on nausea um, and uh, brain damage related to uh, hepatic encephalopathy and a variety of other conditions. It also may be one of the bases for its anticonvulsant effect. It also works on adenosine A2A receptor, uh, boosts its effects, and may be responsible for some of the anti-inflammatory benefits. Uh, an interesting one that has not been tested in humans is, at least in animals, it prevents so, slow virus formation, uh, prions, like in mad cow disease or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And as we've heard before, it, it stimulates fracture healing. Now, at least in my country, there are many misconceptions about cannabidiol. I'm afraid that people rely on a lot of their information from the internet, which is not always accurate. Um, in our dispensaries, if someone has a uh, type of cannabis with a little bit of CBD, they may uh, advertise this. But um, although it's an incredible uh, medicinal agent, cannabidiol isn't particularly potent. You usually need to have quite a bit of it to exert its best effects. Um, another uh, myth is that it's sedating. In fact, cannabidiol at low and moderate doses is stimulatory. This has been proven by electroencephalograms. Um, actually, what happens is many types of cannabis that have a good amount of CBD will all also be very high in myrcene, a terpenoid that is sedative, and so the two are confused. But it is not a sedating molecule except like in a context where it's used with clobazam, an anticonvulsant, and it will lead to a buildup of a metabolite and dismethyl clobazam, which is very sedating. But you don't get rid of the cannabidiol to, to take care of this. You lower the dose of clobazam, and that alleviates the problem. Also, there was an article earlier this year that claimed that uh, cannabidiol uh, they used simulated gas, uh, gastric acid and showed that it could be converted into THC and claimed that this was a danger in the human body, where actually it does not occur at all. And this has been proven by giving people high doses of cannabidiol and testing blood levels, and no THC is seen at all. Um, I've just written an article that will be in the trends in pharmacology ecological sciences uh, journal shortly that deals with some of these misconceptions. Um, I wanted to show a quick slide uh, to show the benefits of THC and CBD together as Sativex, which also has other cannabinoids and terpenoids. Um, we're, we're looking here at a study of cancer pain um, that was intractable. It was not sufficiently treated by available medicines, including the opioids like morphine. Um, these patients were in hospice. They were treated for two weeks, beginning to end. There were actually three preparations, placebo, Sativex, uh, high THC extract, and high CBD extract together, and a high THC extract alone. 
If you see at the 30% level in the gray, that's a response to placebo. Right next to it in blue is the response to the high THC extract. It's not really too different in this particular study. But the green is Sativex, uh, the only difference being that this has got CBD in addition to TBC, I'm sorry, THC and the other uh, agents, and it is uh, statistically significantly better. And this is a, a demonstration of synergy, the boosting of effect uh, from a whole plant extract. Another demonstration, sometimes we're looking, synergy can mean better pain control with, with multiple agents, but it can also mean a reduction in side effects, and here we have a demonstration of that. I've already mentioned Marinol, the synthetic THC. It's well known in experiments like this one, uh, where they were giving um, even a dose of as low as 10 or 15 milligrams could produce a toxic psychosis. Uh, in the common parlance, this is people freaking out, getting paranoid, um, having hallucinations even. But um, a study was done to test effects of Sativex on the heart, and at 48 milligrams, only four people out of 250 had this toxic psychosis reaction. So what we've demonstrated is with cannabidiol present, you've increased the therapeutic index of cannabis uh, as compared to THC alone, uh, where it's very low. Therapeutic index is the difference between the dose that reduces symptoms and that produces uh, that which produces intol uh, intolerable side effects. Um, this slide uh, is too small for you to read, uh, but hopefully uh, we can get you access to the article uh, Taming THC from five years ago. Uh, it's to demonstrate the terpenoids in cannabis and how they contribute uh, to synergy of the whole plant. What you can see is some common other plants like lemons, pine needles, uh, hops, lavender, um, and uh, they have terpenoids in them that are common to cannabis. Uh, so the smells might be more familiar to you or some of the effects would be illustrated. But the terpenoids contribute in a great way to the effects of cannabis on pain. It's psychoactive effects, hopefully in a good way, um, and uh, other modulation of the uh, THC to make it more acceptable as a medicine. I'd like to spend a moment talking about the controversy about cannabis species. Um, actually, the name cannabis sativa, cultivated cannabis, uh, was first used by Leonhard Fuchs about 250 years before Linnaeus. Linnaeus did codify it uh, as uh, cannabis sativa, but, uh, and there's a picture of the plant, the voucher uh, from it, and this would be the hemp of Europe. Uh, about 25 years later, Lamarck in France described a plant from India. But it was also a thin leaf, but bushier, um, more leaves. Uh, he thought this was a different species called Cannabis indica. And there has never been agreement since. Many people will say there's one species of cannabis. Some will say there are five. Um, but I maintain that that's less important than what's in it. I'd like to outline what I think we need to know about cannabis, how we should describe it. Um, you'd, we'd like to know what the plant looked like. Was it tall? Was it thin? Was it bushy? Were the leaflets narrow or were they broad? Um, most importantly, we want to know the cannabinoid content and the terpenoid content. And I feel that both of these are critical to a doctor or a consumer knowing what they're getting. Um, It'd be good to know what the scent is like, what the taste is like, and most importantly, what patients say about its effects when they take it. In other words, what is it good for? Um, one way that this has worked is in this publication from NAPRO Research um, that, again, we can get for you. Um, but particularly on the right, this is a reporting system called Phytofax, um, and this has been patented. Um, 
it's hard to see, but I'll describe what, what it has in it, and that is a description of how much cannabinoids there are, which ones are predominant, how much terpenoids, the percentages of each, a picture of the plant. In the third panel down, you have uh, lemons and pepper, which indicates in this uh, meaning that um, it has a lot of limonene um, and caryophylline. Uh, like those plants have. And there's a description of the effects, uh, uh, tasting and smelling, and what patients report on the right, um, that this one is non-sedating, um, and um, it's elevating on mood. Most importantly on the bottom, you see a long yellow bar, which indicates a high limonene content, which is a mood elevator, very good for depression. The big blue bar is caryophylline, uh, the CB2 agonist anti-inflammatory. Um, and then finally, at the bottom, you see a very little purple bar. This is myrcene, that sedating agent that often you do better having low amounts of. It is an anti-inflammatory, but the reason that many types of cannabis are so prone to produce sleep is because of too much myrcene. Uh, we've discussed a little bit of the drawbacks of uh, THC alone. Uh, um, this is, uh, as I mentioned, has a very poor therapeutic index. Um, it's very expensive, poorly tolerated by patients, and it really lacks the synergistic components that make cannabis unique as a medicine. It is true today that smoking is still the most commonly used method of application. Um, I've always maintained that this is not the best approach, particularly for a medicinal. Um, because of the inhalation is so rapid, it gets into the, the body so fast, this is the most productive of intoxication. Um, it actually is not very efficient. There's a lot of waste of THC. Somewhere between 10 and 30 percent is really available. 60 percent of a single inhalation is done with a pipe. Uh, one reason that this would rarely, if ever, be approved by a regulatory body in a country is because of the presence of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, these are carcinogenic uh, agents, and it, although it's true that on, smoking cannabis alone does not produce lung cancer, commonly in Europe, cannabis is smoked with tobacco, which can do that. And additionally, the liver's got to metabolize these, and it's uh, something that would prevent uh, this being accepted by, for example, the Food and Drug Administration as a medicine. But there are additional dangers if cannabis is not grown properly. We have a huge problem in the states with pesticide contamination. Um, and uh, in a recent experiment by Sullivan et al., they showed that when specific common pesticides used on cannabis were added to it with a smoking machine that you re could recover about 70 up to 70% of those pesticides in the uh, smoke that was produced. And these would be rapidly absorbed, and this is potentially very dangerous. Uh, we actually studied this in Washington State, where I live, where cannabis is legal in the state. But um, in their stupidity, it was not made a requirement that there be testing for pesticides. Um, so we uh, bought um, 26 samples of cannabis on the legal market. Most were concentrates because that's what's most popular for youth today in that market. On uh, a couple of flowers, and these were sent to a state certified lab and analyzed. Unfortunately, the results were very discouraging and alarming. Um, 22 out of 26, or 85%, had pesticides, and it was not small amounts. It was huge amounts. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of parts per billion uh, were there. And there were many different ones, 24 distinct pesticides of every class, including neonicotinoids, which are responsible for the, the colony collapse disorder, the loss of honeybees uh, throughout North America. Um, 
Hopefully you're not having as many problems here, but this is quite possible. But this is a serious ecological issue. Um, again, these are too small to see, but we can send you the article that has all these in detail, the 24 agents that we're seeing. Um, and there are many uh, seriously toxic uh, chemicals. We'll just give one example. This is carbaryl that was found on one sample at 255 times the limit that would be present for use on a food agent, which this is not. Uh, none of these have ever been tested for a crop that is smoked and inhaled. But this is a cholinesterase inhibitor, and doses that are too high, these will produce seizures in anyone. Given that cannabis is used to treat seizures in children, you understand why this is so potentially dangerous. Additionally, this agent is carcinogenic. Uh, it's also a developmental and reproductive toxin and likely an endocrine disruptor, uh, too. It could cause precocious puberty. Uh, since this does not belong in anyone's medicine. Additionally, um, cannabis has the property of being a bioaccumulator. Hemp can be grown on a, an old mining site and recruit the heavy metals out of the soil, and then that, that could be disposed of elsewhere. But you see, if this is going to be used as medicine, that this is a potential problem because those heavy metals would get into the plant as well. Uh, so this is something else that requires testing and monitoring. Um, we've heard reference to vaporization, which is preferable to smoking, but it still has some issues, I'm afraid. You see a demonstration from left to right of un untreated dried cannabis after vaporization at 175 degrees Celsius, 195, and then 230, which was the highest setting on this machine. At that temperature, it's pretty toasted, but not quite burned. So this is an improvement over smoking, but unfortunately, no vaporizer that's been tested to date has shown an elimination of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. It's possible that this could be done, but it hasn't been done yet. Additionally, if the plant is grown with artificial fertilizers, it will tend to produce ammonia, which is a neurotoxin, and is certainly not eliminated by vaporization. These are some other formulations that have been available in North America. Um, of course, the buds. Um, there's been a big problem with uh, confections, candies, that look like real candy bars, and you could see how this is very attractive to children and could lead to some problems. Uh, this was a survey that was done a few years back uh, looking at preferences of medicinal users. Um, and what we see is uh, that smoking still predominated uh, a few years ago, and although half of people had tried vaporization, only half of those, 27%, preferred it. So they weren't applying good harm reduction in the use of their medicine. Even better, with no effect, bad effects on the lungs, would be ingestion. But very few of the, the patients, 13%, were using it orally. Okay? And for a chronic disease, this is most often the best approach. Uh, at least in the States, Everything in selective breeding until recently has been aimed at higher and higher amounts of THC, which is generally what the recreational user wants. Um, just using uh, conventional techniques uh, to make uh, hashish, either with water or with sifting, it's possible to get the THC level up to about 62%. But apparently that's not enough for some people. As I mentioned, there's been a move towards concentrates. Usually this will require the use of a solvent. Often these are flammable or explosive, and so there are dangers attached. Uh, every couple of weeks in the area where I live, there will be a fire and an explosion where someone gets hurt because they are making a concentrate in their home without proper ventilation, um, particularly with butane, um, uh, which often is contaminated uh, with other 
petroleum products uh, and it's potentially dangerous. Uh, well known when it's so-called RSO, Rick Simpson oil made with naphtha, which is always a product that uh, is potentially dangerous to ingest. Um, so I, the real question is, how high a THC do you need to treat your symptoms as a patient? Um, the aim is not to get high. Anyone can manage this. Uh, and a concentrate does it all too well. Um, rather, small doses are needed to treat symptoms in most instances. And the real emphasis in treatment should be to use the smallest amount that reduces the pain or reduces the spasticity without making the person intoxicated. Uh, there's been a movement now also in the U.S. towards vape pens. So these have concentrates in a self-contained unit with a battery. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some of these, because the material is so thick, it needs to be dissolved in something like propylene glycol and glycerol. If this material is heated to too high a temperature, it produces formaldehyde, which is what they embalm people with, and is also carcinogenic. Uh, so this is, again, not something that anyone needs to be inhaling, and there need to be better ways. Um, I think I may have skipped a slide. Okay, and so this is a demonstration of how the vape pen works. The very thick material in B is, is called wax. Um, this is what the heating element looks like before you turn it on, but as soon as you press the button, and those are my hands, um, it's red hot. This isn't really vaporization. This is a form of burning, and you see why there is the potential for toxic byproducts to be produced. Um, I wanted to show this example from our friend Donald Abrams, uh, who did a study of um, uh, using cannabis to treat neuropathic pain in HIV AIDS. And I'm not picking on him, but this is the type of study that is only allowed, uh, only this type of study is allowed in the US, and we'll see why it has, has problems. So they had 50 patients who used smoked cannabis f three times a day for five days, very limited trial. They required that all of them have used cannabis before, so you couldn't say that the results would be the same for someone who'd never used cannabis, and it's not the entire population. So it did reduce pain and hyperalgesia and excess uh, type of pain. 52% uh, had a 30% or better reduction in their pain after five days. However, the side effects were very prominent. Um, anxiety, 25%. Sedation, 54%. Disorientation, 16%. 13% paranoia. This type of drug could never be approved as a pharmaceutical in the United States. So um, this is not the answer, but it doesn't mean that other forms of cannabis properly constituted and applied cannot do a lot better. They absolutely can and have. One example is um, Nabiximols or uh, Sativex. I used to work for this company, was involved in the development. As I previously mentioned, this is a whole cannabis extract with CBD and THC as well as some terpenoids. Um, each spray, which is 100 microliters, supplies 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD uh, into the mouth where it's absorbed and some is swallowed. Um, it has an intermediate onset. If you took enough to feel it, it would take 15 to 40 minutes. So it's slower than smoking or uh, vaporization, but that's probably good because there are fewer side effects immediately. Um, and it's been acceptable to patients. Uh, it's, everything is controlled. It's from cloned plants, vegetative propagation. It's 77 days from the cutting placed in the ground to harvest. Uh, it's done in organic media, no pesticides. When they're bad bugs, they're eaten by good bugs in what's called integrated pest management. Everything controlled. To show differences in uh, the 
purity. Um, we have a, uh, an example of Moroccan hashish called soap bar, which had equal amounts of THC and CBD, much like Sativex. Um, and the comparison on a thin layer chromatography, on the right you see uh, the nabiximols or Sativex with its THC and CBD and light uh, terpenoids. In comparison, the resin extract has all this stuff at the bottom, and we don't know what that is. It could be soap, it could be wax, it could be camel dung. So um, this hashish is not a suitable medical product. Uh, another demonstration is, over time, when you're making a pharmaceutical from a plant, a botanical, you have to demonstrate very exact um, capability that it will be the same throughout time. So this is nine years of data, 25 different batches, and it looks like single peaks. There are many peaks there because of all the components in this medicine, um, but it doesn't look like different batches because the variation in the amounts is so tiny because of the genetic consistency and the processing uh, being the same over time. Um, in the United States, we, critics will often say, oh, there are no studies showing that cannabis works as medicine. Well, this is just an outright lie. Uh, these are just the um, studies in multiple sclerosis, the clinical trials. The one with the X is when an unsuccessful trial. Almost all the others had positive results, and all of these are available. Um, and these are the studies and just the published studies in pain. And this includes neuropathic pain, central or peripheral, cancer pain, and um, non-cancer pain as well. Uh, all of these were positive except for one. Um, just as a demonstration in the United States, the studies that have been done of smoked or vaporized cannabis for pain give us a total of three patient years. In comparison, the published studies on Sativex are 6,000 patient years. So you see there's a great difference in the documentation. Now, uh, the problem in the United States has been that the government has restricted the duration and the numbers. Uh, so they could never generate this type of experience uh, with that product because I would maintain to you that the trials were designed to fail. Not only were they so limited that they wouldn't be available for regulatory approval, but the, the material is not standardized as supplied by the U.S. government, and it would not be available for a subsequent trial if you had something that worked, a system designed to fail. Now, we need to spend a little bit of time uh, on side effects. People will say, some people will say that cannabis has no side effects, when someone says that, they've lost the argument. It isn't true. It does have side effects, but they're easily controlled uh, with the right preparation properly administered. Now, of course, the most common are central nervous system effects, specifically the anxiety, the paranoia that we've heard about previously. Those are far and away the most important. So here we have a list of those. You see euphoria listed. I will not tell you that euphoria is a bad thing. However, in the United States, it's considered a side effect. Uh, it's not necessary to have it to benefit on your pain or other symptoms, however. Um, more serious side effects outside the nervous system would include orthostatic hypotension, and this happens a great deal with concentrates. Even someone who's used to cannabis, the dose is so high, they will inhale and they will hit the floor. They will pass out because of a strong vagal reaction uh, such that they can't get enough blood to their, their head. Now, the bad part is um, they end up in the emergency room and they hurt themselves and hit their head. Um, but uh, after a faint like this, it, it sort of takes care of itself because the heart and the head end up at the same level and usually they'll wake up. But it is a serious side effect that causes a great deal of consternation. This is a comparison 
of um, chronic use of Sativex as the spray in the mouth as compared to use of smoked cannabis in government-approved programs in Canada and in the Netherlands. Now, what you'll see is the warm uh, colors are smoking and the cool colors are Sativex. In every instance, except for, um, for nausea, you've got higher bars for smoking. And uh, particularly anything having to do with the lungs, cough, phlegm, etc., it's high for smoking and there's none uh, for this spray in the mouth. Um, but you see in this instance, and this is with older studies of Sativex with very high doses, that in general the Sativex, Sativex profile showed about a half to even a third as many side effects as compared to smoking. And these are all patients chronically, by choice, using cannabis-based medicine in one form or another. Now, more recently, um, Sativex has been used in lower doses, uh, just enough to control symptoms. So we have a comparison here between the old studies in blue and the newer ones in red. And this is all patients with MS. And you see the prior high incidence of dizziness has been cut in half. Fatigue, somnolence, every one of these most common side effects has been substantially reduced by using a lower dose and going more slowly in titration, getting to the dose that's effective. And this is the best advice to anyone using cannabis. We say in English, start low and go slow. Uh, just uh, showing that uh, Sativex has been apportioned out to different drug companies to market. Uh, I believe it's Novartis for Chile. Um, it is approved in 27 countries for uh, spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's also approved in Canada for cancer pain and pain in MS. But I want to talk now a little bit uh, about a laboratory analysis. In the United States, theoretically, virtually all the laboratory work done on cannabis is illegal because they don't have licenses to handle a forbidden substance. Um, but it's more than that. Uh, there have been very poor standards, uh, very poor application of uh, procedures, and so we get a situation that one sample sent to multiple labs will have wildly divergent results. Additionally, some labs look at the plant and guess how much cannabinoid it has in it. That's called dry labbing is the slang term. Um, cannabinoids are hard to study. They're very sticky hard to work with, but the terpenoids are even worse. They're also sticky and the amounts are tiny even though they have a strong pharmacological effect. Now I want to talk about what makes a medicine. To me there are four aspects, the four pillars of a true medicine. It has to be efficacious, that it works for the reason you want it. It has to be safe and you prove that by monitoring and uh, seeing what the side effect profile is. To be an approved medicine as a pharmaceutical, it has to be standardized, consistent from one time to another, as we've shown. Finally, and this is the one they don't talk about so much, it has to be accessible. Is it available in your country? Is it at a cost that you can afford? And I would say, remember, I have worked in industry, but I am in total agreement with Ana Maria in that a medicine that is too expensive does no one any good. Uh, there is a blueprint, uh, this guidance for industry, uh, that tells how a plant-based medicine, a botanical, can become a prescription medicine in the United States. It's only been done a couple of times on, and not yet for a uh, cannabis-based medicine, but next year, likely Epidiolex, the primarily cannabidiol medicine for seizures will be approved. Now, a little bit of criticism. Um, I've been working in this area for 20 years. I have strong ideas about the good and the bad approaches. But we need to know what should be done in a clinical trial uh, with a cannabinoid. Um, 
But the available trials so far have mostly been too short. We had five days for Dr. Abrams' study. The usual duration of a study for nerve-based pain is 12 weeks. Five, week, uh, five days, 12 weeks, that's a big gulf. Uh, the studies have largely been too small in size with cannabis as an herb. Um, and again, there's been this unstandardized material, so the results are unreproducible. But you could use a different preparation the next time, do it the exact same way, and get a different result. Um, additionally, particularly with the smoke studies, the blinding has not been adequate. Almost always, because of the intoxication, people knew what they were getting. And um, if you don't have good blinding, the conventional wisdom is it's not a, a suitable study. In, in contrast, the blinding with Sativex studies has been excellent. Uh, so, the studies that have been done do not advance the process to regulatory approval, at least in the U.S. Where are we now with the study of cannabis as medicine? We've got solid evidence of the benefits of cannabinoids on numerous areas, nausea and vomiting, uh, anorexia associated with chemotherapy, HIV, AIDS, the spasticity and MS, of course, neuropathic pain of various types, cancer pain, there have been some positive trials, two phase twos, uh, also lower urinary tract symptoms. For cannabidiol, the efficacy has been shown in epilepsy and also in schizophrenia, both positive and negative symptoms, very promising. One study actually showed it equal to a standard uh, medicine. Um, what should we be studying? Well, pain is always paramount. In surveys of why people use cannabis for medicine, 70% in most surveys will be for pain. Uh, our aging population has a big problem with arthritis, and that could be rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. Of course, the inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, now, uh, we haven't talked about another uh, cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabivarin actually reduce hunger and are very good for treating the metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Um, as far as I can see, most Chileans are relatively thin. In my country, we have an epidemic of obesity, and there's a serious need for this kind of medicine. We've talked a little bit about dermatology, of course, neuroprotection. But there are other things that could be done to treat these kind of conditions without cannabis. Uh, and these would be measures that optimize endocannabinoid tone. There are many plants uh, and lifestyle factors like aerobic exercise that increase the gain of the endocannabinoid system where you might not need cannabis. Um, so what do we need? We need standardized, good manufacturing practice materials that have appropriate cannabinoid and terpenoid profiles for the condition that's being treated. And we need genuine phase two and phase three studies that meet the criteria of the FDA or the regulatory body in a given country. Um, there are a lot of case studies out there. They're very interesting, but they don't advance the cause in terms of drug approval. I'm always interested in these, but we've got a lot already. We know it works for many conditions. The same is true for surveys. And what we don't need is for NIDA, the agency in the U.S. that supplies cannabis, to be the main suppliers for these studies because of the drawbacks uh, that I've already pointed out because this is a waste of public funds. So to conclude, cannabis has proven medicinal potential. It's led to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, which is a major physiologic regulator. Uh, cannabis and its proper formulation can be an approved pharmaceutical, and it can meet all the criteria that are necessary of safety, efficacy, and consistency. So with that, I'll thank you.